Good afternoon, everyone. Go ahead and take your seats and we'll get started here. I want to welcome you to this session um, where we're going to talk about innovation and advanced reactor construction oversight. My name is Rob Taylor. I'm the Deputy Office Director for New Reactors at the NRC, and I'm joined by an esteemed panel that I'll introduce as they make their presentation. So thank you for coming today and, and joining us at this session. I'm looking forward to a good uh, discussion, and we look forward to your insights, perspectives, and questions as we go. So we're going to follow a moderated panel discussion format. Uh, following the presentations from our panelists, we will have a guided discussion and take questions from the audience with any time remaining. So please use the QR code uh, for the session to ask any questions, because if you don't, I have a bunch lined up for them. And I'd rather get to your questions uh, and make sure that we have plenty of time to ask uh, those. So uh, you may submit them at any time. There's no need to wait uh, for the QA portion of the session to begin. So as you've heard, a major theme for the NRC and the industry is the deployment of SMRs and advanced reactors. And in looking at that, we have to take a holistic look at all the aspects that are needed to support the transformation needed to deploy these technologies. And we recognize that advanced reactors are going to pose new and unique challenges in a number of different areas, including construction oversight. So as, as we undertake these activities, we need to be, make sure that they're commensurate with the risk profile of these designs, and I ask what inspections are truly necessary for us to implement and ensure that the plants are, design, are constructed as designed. As you'll hear from the panelists, we issued a commission paper in June of last year to share our vision for construction oversight for advanced reactors, including the seven key principles that are vital to the effective design and implementation of such a program. We're committed to hearing a variety of stakeholder inputs to ensure the program is designed consistent with these principles. Today's session is one opportunity. We will continue to have public engagement and meetings going forward to seek your input and insights into a number of key topics that must be identified as we build the program and then we engage the commission with any uh, critical policy issues that we need to undertake. So with that, and without further ado, I'm gonna to start to introduce our panelists and they'll start to give their presentations. So, to my right is Nicole Kuvert, uh, the Acting Director of the Division of Construction Oversight in Region 2. She's responsible for the management of NRC's oversight of construction activities at Vogel 3 and 4, and is now working on the inspection program development for new construction and fuel facilities, advanced reactors, and non-power production and utilization facilities. I've known Nicole for a number of years here, and she was instrumental in the agency's activities to oversee the safe construction of Vogel and ensure it was ready to commence uh, commercial operation. To her right is John Greaves. He's the chief of the Division of Operating Reactor Safety in Region 1. He's responsible for the implementation of the reactor oversight process for three operating large light water reactors. In addition to these duties, he took on an opportunity and responsibility to help us provide leadership to the NRC team responsible for the development of the Advanced Reactor Construction Oversight Program. So now I'll turn it over to Nicole and John to start their presentation. Thank you, Rob. And good afternoon, everyone. The potential, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. The potential future for the advanced reactor construction landscape is projected to be very diverse. This diversity includes different reactor and containment designs that may be entirely new designs or may have had limited or no prior commercial applications in the United States. I would like to provide a disclaimer that the potential designs that I will discuss have not been licensed and or these designs may be in ca some cases conceptual and are subject to change. But for the purposes of this discussion, it's important to highlight the diversity that is on the horizon and how does the agency consider this input when developing and implementing construction oversight framework. Advanced reactors can be small modular reactors, micro reactors, and include light water and non-light water designs. But in general, these designs are anticipated to be simpler with enhanced safety margin and risk profile, and as a result, require less safety-related structures, systems, or components, or SSCs, and as applicable, less ITAC, which is inspections, tests, analysis, and acceptance criteria, compared with the traditional large light water reactors built in the US in the past. Additionally, some general design criteria, which is listed in Appendix A of 10 CFR Part 50, may not be applicable based upon the proposed licensing and design basis. 
For example, a reactor and coolant system may be designed such that a potential accident scenario is not credible. One proposed design may not need to consider a loss of coolant accident as a credible event, or may not need a containment structure for the purpose of containing fission products. Proposed advanced reactors designs may have minimal or not required active safety systems, have minimal or no safety related electrical systems, or have minimum or no operator actions needed to mitigate the consequences for an event while still ensuring reactor core safety and public health and safety. For example, one passive design feature uses natural circulation with no electrical power or active pumps and provides decay heat removal during normal operations and post-accident response. These potential designs also foster new reactor fuel types to be used in commercial plants in the U.S., like triso fuel pellets and molten chloride salt fuels in addition to the standard light water reactor fuel. Based upon the pressure and temperature of the normal operating system, standard industry construction codes may be also be different. Additionally, proposed designs may introduce new initiating events or material interactions, like interactions with sodium and, or, and water, steam, or air interactions that may result in unintended reactions. All of these examples might be considered as new inspection attributes to incorporate into construction inspection programs. Other items to consider for oversight framework include wide range of sizes and locations for nuclear reactor sites, including co-location with fuel facilities. The construction of advanced reactors may include higher uses of modularization, including greater uses of system installation and testing off-site locations like manufacturers. Construction strategies may also result in overall shorter construction and operational readiness schedules. And last, depending on the advanced reactor licensing paths for Part 50, 52, or 53 licensing requirements dictate what types of information is required for specific licensing actions, and as a result, applicable design information may differ during different stages of construction times that are used to inform inspection scoping and planning. Next slide, please. In addition to design and associated margin and risk profiles, it is important to consider previous construction projects, lessons learned, and best practices. Some of the oversight framework that the NRC has utilized since 2010 are for the AP1000s reactors licensed under Part 52, Watts Bar Unit 2 construction under Part 50 licensing, non-power production and utilization facilities, or NPUFs, for shine, also under Part 50, and fuel cycle facilities under Part 70. The NRC construction inspection staff that conducted these inspections for fuel facilities, NPUFs, and reactor construction projects are working together with the program offices to identify the best practices across the different NRC business lines to develop consistent inspection guidance. And by taking this approach, lessons learned and best practices are leveraged across the different areas, which results in more efficient and effective oversight programs that also benefit in cost savings across the energy, uh, across the agency, the industry, and the U.S. taxpayers. Next slide, please. The staff is considering construction recommendations from both external and internal lessons learned. For external lessons learned, the NRC is collaboratively working with international regulators, along with reviewing lessons learned from international projects, industry working groups, and industry stakeholders where appropriate and applicable. The staff also leveraged internal lessons learned report performed for the Part 52 and construction at Vogel 3 and 4 and VC Summer Units 2 and 3, the Watts Bar Unit 2, and new reg 1055. These are all publicly available reports and the, and the Adams ML numbers are listed on the slides. Most recently, for the Part 52 Lessons Learned report, the staff noted that although the targeted inspections were successfully implemented in the Construction Reactor Oversight Process, or CROP, for the first of a kind AP1000 plants in the United States, the NRC's process for targeting ITAC and the programmatic requirements for their inspections were found to be too prescriptive and did not 
provide for a flexible or user-friendly means to adjust when planned inspections could not be performed due to the changing construction schedules. The working group recommended for future oversight programs there should be a flexibility to select a representative sample of inspections throughout any construction area and not require pre-selected ITACs to make up the baseline inspections. This would promote more agile inspection coverage while continuing to maintain reasonable assurance that facilities are built and will operate in accordance with their approved designs and licensing basis. Next slide, please. The NRC is taking a holistic approach to the revisions and the development of the construction oversight framework. Where in the past, inspection program guidance was written for the specific project occurring at the time, now the staff is intentionally considering future oversight processes and inspection scoping that is risk-informed, scalable, performance-based, and technology-neutral that can accommodate different types and sizes of projects. Additionally, future oversight processes and inspection scoping needs to be flexible without focusing on inspection planning on dis discrete or specific items that can lead to inefficient uses of resources, especially with changing construction schedules. Next slide, please. In addition to inspection, oversight framework includes enforcement and assessment. Lessons learned for the enforcement process for facilities and construction are first, Significant determination should appropriately characterize findings, significance based upon risk to future operations, and should be comparable to risk thresholds in the reactor oversight process, or ROP. Second, determining the significance of construction findings should be based upon a risk-informed, safety-focused inspection and enforcement process, with time spent proportional to the safety and risk significance of the SSC along with the potential for an issue to have remained undetected and impl impact plant oper operations in the future. Next slide, please. Last, the assessment element for an overall construction oversight program provides a key method for determining and resolving issues impacting safety. Looking forward, advanced reactors may have shorter construction timeframes and therefore include faster completion times for structures and systems. The current annual assessment frequency in the CROP was based upon an annual assessment period. Unlike the ROP for operating reactors with consistent annual baseline inspections, facilities under construction have dynamic schedules and performance. From one year to another, the amount and type of work, including different contractors and vendors involved, will differ. So one year's performance comparison to another is not always equal. Additionally, assessment periods may potentially be too long for a faster moving project. As a result, future construction oversight programs should consider a system of more continuous assessment and more frequent public communications. I will turn it over to John Greaves to discuss aspects and considerations for the future construction oversight process for advanced reactors. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Next slide, please. The objectives of the Construction Oversight Program remain unchanged in that it supports the NRC mission by providing uh, independent verification that uh, facilities are built and will continue and, and will operate in accordance with their approved licensing basis. To do this, uh, oversight for advanced reactor construction focuses on the verification of the quality of those SSCs that are integral to the safe operation of the facility and verification that security and other operational programs are in place to support operations. Said another way, the Construction Oversight Program supports the NRC's licensing decision to allow operation of the facility through either issuance of an operating license for Part 50 applicants or 103G finding for Part 52 applicants by providing an independent verification through a risk-informed, performance-based sampling program. To meet the objectives of the construction program, in uh, June of last year, we documented seven key principles uh, that, are, that are key to development of the oversight program. We documented that in SECI 230048. Those principles, in, uh, of those principles, risk-informed and performance-based remain pillars to any oversight program and will guide us to ensure that we focus on the most risk-significant as aspects of design and that we consider the observation and review of infield performance in addition to paperwork reviews when appropriate and possible, and that we use our assessment process to adjust our oversight footprint. Technology inclusive refers to ensuring that the program covers the full spectrum of reactor technologies that Nicole described earlier that are being considered for NRC licensing. 
Scalability is important because it ensures our inspection efforts remain uh, commensurate with the facility's public health and safety risk. Informed by experience, such that it implies the construction oversight experience and leverages lessons learned from past and current NRC inspection programs and other external sources. Comprehensive in that, in that the program is designed to consider all possible manufacturing models and diverse licensing approaches. And lastly, innovative in that it leverages new inspection tools and approaches to enhance efficiency and effectiveness whenever possible. Next slide, please. To construct a technology inclusive program that can be used to develop inspection plans and assess construction performance for all new designs, we started by looking for safety based commonalities across all reactors. While each designer will develop their own methodology for SSC classification in accordance with standards and guidance applicable to their design, we found that orienting the program to three fundamental safety functions in each, uh, that are inherent in each design, namely reactivity control, heat removal, and radionuclide retention. And that by orienting the program in that way, we would ensure that we do the minimum amount of inspection necessary to verify that the plant has been constructed in accordance with its license. Orienting the inspection to these three functions, in addition to inspection of security and operational programs, enables efficient and effective inspection. Next slide, please. Building off this technology inclusive framework, our team is looking for at three key areas of our oversight framework to optimize our approach. Performance monitoring, enforcement, including significance determination, and assessing and assessment. We are identifying options for each of these three areas and planning extensive internal and external outreach to ensure our program fully meets the vision described in SECI 230048 and is consistent with the program's guiding principles that were previously mentioned, as well as our principles of good regulation. Next slide, please. While performance monitoring includes inspection, allegations, and use of operating experience or construction experience, the team is currently focused on how we determine the scope of our inspection and how we execute those inspections. Regarding inspection scoping, we are currently considering a range of options that uh, ensures our inspection footprint is risk-informed and performance-based while fully leveraging past experience. For inspection scoping, there are three options that we're currently evaluating that include various levels of flexibility. On one side of the spectrum, a targeting process can be used to ensure that we focus on the mis most risk significant items. Think of that like plugging uh, your destination into MapQuest, printing out your map, and heading out on your road trip. In that case, the program will tell you the route, tell the driver exactly where, how to get from point A to point B. While this has benefits uh, by making sure that we focus on the most risk significant items, our experience with the AP1000 construction demonstrated it can uh, be less than optimal. On the other side of the spectrum is availability based inspection, where we inspect activity that is occurring on site while we're there and cover the remainder through document reviews. Think of this like grabbing your hard copy map and setting off on your road trip. You have the most flexibility but can obviously find yourself in a less than efficient trip. In the middle is using baseline inspection scoping matrices which provide sufficient information about plant design as well as plant and construction risk to allow inspectors to make informed decisions about the best inspection samples to choose within ranges determined appropriate by the design. In this case, ample information and options are provided via their preferred navigational application to the, that the driver or ins our inspection staff can reach their destination in the most optimal way possible. Next slide, please. As articulated in previous commission direction that, that Nicole referenced, our enforcement actions need to be assessed from the perspective of impact of future plant operations. It is recognized that there is limited nuclear safety risk during construction. Any deficiency identified needs to be assessed based on the likelihood that it could have gone on to exist during operations and then the consequence of such deficiency on the safe and secure operation of the facility. With that paradigm in mind, the team is developing options to assess the risk significance of identified issues in a technology inclusive and efficient manner such that new risk tools are not needed to be developed for each design and that we can reach an accurate assessment of risk without the need for extensive quantitative analyses. Inherent in this is the recognition of the barriers that exist during construction to ensure that deficiencies are identified and corrected prior to plant operations, which includes all the quality assurance program attributes that are fundamental to the approval of a permit or license. Next slide, please. In an oversight program, the assessment process is used to guide our decision making in response licensee performance. For advanced reactor construction oversight, some aspects will remain while the new landscape guides us to relook at these feedback loops as they can uh, to continue to evolve. In an ongoing basis, our program needs to be flexible to evolve as we rapidly develop construction experience. This includes uh, adjusting the amount of baseline inspection as we gain confidence with the licensee's ability to implement their quality assurance programs, processes, and procedures, as well as responding to performance issues uh, in a risk-informed and predictable manner. 
It also includes adjusting our oversight program the, from the first reactor through the nth so that our oversight program is appropriately scaled to the specific circumstances that each build represents. Next slide, please. While construction of lead projects isn't expected for a couple of years, our team is aggressively developing options and will be working over the next two years to refine those options into inspection documentation for use by staff. We expect this effort to include a large amount of out outreach so that the various viewpoints are heard. In fact, we're currently in the middle of a series of public workshops where we're presenting options to interested stakeholders and intend to leverage that feedback to build the best program possible. We're committed to keeping all stakeholders informed of our progress, including the Commission, and will engage on potential policy issues early to provide clarity. While we recognize the need for uh, a working program, while we recognize the need for a working program in time for these early projects, we also acknowledge that the program will continue to evolve in the future as new technologies are introduced, both for licensees as well as, and manufacturers as well as for inspectors, and experiences gained during construction of earlier builds, and we remain committed to the evolution of the program into the future. Thank you for your time, and I'll turn it back over to Rob. Thanks, Nicole and, and John. Um, appreciate that overview of uh, what the NRC is currently thinking. And as you indicated, we're early in the process, and now's the opportunity for stakeholders to really engage us and help us shape uh, the program as we go forward. So with that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Holtzman, who is the director of New Nuclear at the Nuclear Energy Institute. He is currently focused on developing a more efficient, risk-informed regulatory framework, accelerating industry deployment readiness, and engaging with investors and new end users to understand new nuclear opportunities. Ben, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ben Holtzman, Director of New, uh, New Nuclear at NEI. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to discuss industry's perspective on advanced reactor construction oversight. I'd like to thank NRC for paying attention to this important topic and Rob Taylor for chairing this session. Construction oversight is an, is an important function that is needed to ensure new reactors are constructed in accordance with their approved design and licensing basis thereby providing reasonable assurance of their safe operation once completed. As part of this presentation, I will impress why developing a more efficient construction oversight process is important for both the NRC and industry, as well as highlight a, key, a, key, a few key considerations that we believe should be in a successful program. Next slide, please. As seen on this North American deployment map, there are over 25 nuclear power projects in development today. Vogel Units 3 and 4 leading the way for new nuclear. It's also worth highlighting the ARDP projects, X Energy and Natrium in Texas and Wyoming, respectively. GE Itachi collaborating with OPG on the BWX 300 with TVA as a fast follower. There are also micro reactors and low scale test reactors. Utilities are including nuclear as part of their integrated resource plans. TVA has stated that they need 20 or more SMRs. Duke's IRP showed a similar number. Dominion submitted their plan for six to 18 SMRs in Virginia alone. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Globally, over 6,000 companies are looking to decarbonize themselves and supply chains. Here in the United States, 85% of the population is serviced by utilities who have pledged to decarbonize. But just being clean isn't enough. We also need reliable energy. The combination of reliability, resiliency, and zero carbon emissions is staking a strong position for nuclear energy. In fact, the DOE's pathway to commercial liftoff, along with numerous other studies and surveys, indicate a lot of new nuclear in the decades to come. The DOE liftoff projections are shown here with two different deployment scenarios. The first shows nuclear deployment starting in 2030 at 13 gigawatts per year, which corresponds to about 43 300 megawatt uh, electric SMRs annually. The second figure shows new nuclear deployment starting in 2035 at a rate of 20 gigawatts per year, corresponding to about 67 300 megawatt electric SMRs coming online. This would mean over 100 SMRs are in construction at any given moment, since it takes more than a single year to construct a new plant. If we think that some of this new nuclear growth will be micro-reactors, then there's even more reactors per year. And of course, if we think some of them are large light waters or larger reactors in general, then there's fewer. I don't want to focus on the specific number of new reactors per year for two reasons. First, because all models are wrong, although some are useful. And second, while we may not know the exact number of new nuclear plants per year, 
we're looking at a lot of new nuclear, not one or two. It's no longer a matter of whether to build these versatile, reliable, and clean reactors. It's a matter of how fast we can build them. Of course, the future is a big place. Anything can happen. In 2008, we saw, no one saw the price of natural gas falling from $10 to $3 due to fracking. But there's a real opportunity here if we can seize it. And part of how we can do just that is by rethinking construction oversight. Because if we do things as we've always done, we would need an unreasonable number of workforce for both the industry and NRC. As such, let's talk about how to do things more efficiently. Next slide, please. The NRC also realizes that the status quo is not scalable to support the deployment of hundreds of reactors. Risk-informed thinking is required. As such, the NRC developed RCOP to support the realization of large-scale deployment of new nuclear. Now, as we've heard, new nuclear is a diverse set of technologies, which requires the oversight program to assess, assess the relative risk in a technology-neutral manner. Furthermore, RCOP should incorporate the lessons from construction experience both domestically and internationally. Applicable lessons can be gleaned from the existing fleet, research and test reactors, the AP1000 experience, and even international projects such as uh, Baraka. New nuclear designs come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and the best practices from one experience may or may not be applicable to a specific new design project. For example, non-LWR microreactors may be much closer to a research and test reactor than a large light water reactor. And as the Commission noted yesterday, the hours spent on oversight should reflect the safety significance and risk associated with the activity. Some of these best practices and lessons learned are already being documented, but will still need to be incorporated into the RCOP program. The most recent construction lessons learned report came out this January. It discusses the lessons learned from the Part 52 construction for Vogel and VC summer projects, focusing on potential improvements for the oversight of future construction projects using the same Part 52 licensing framework. As it's already been discussed more specifically of what this covers, it highlights again ITACs and licensing activities during construction. Additionally, NRC has the opportunity to improve the construction regulatory process by incorporating improvements as identified during the 5052 Lessons Learned rulemaking activity. These changes can also improve regulatory efficiency during construction and play an important role in enabling widespread deployment of new nuclear. It's important that the risk-informed RCOP program work through and articulate how oversight would actually change between different deployment scenarios. We encourage engagement and discussion with industry to ensure that the program is indeed scalable, technology neutral, and comprehensive. There are many key questions that still need to be worked on. Where does enforcement and oversight get applied? How does offsite manufacturing and assembly interface with a facility's QA program? In the past, all construction activities were done on site, so it was straightforward that the licensee was responsible. But it's less clear what happens as work shifts to off-site locations as parts, modules, and even reactors are completed in advance, potentially without even knowing their destination. Our takeaway message here is that a flexible strategy to right-size construction oversight would be a benefit to both industry and NRC. Next slide, please. I also want to highlight some of the things that industry is doing to ensure that we can deploy new nuclear reactors more efficiently. First, the NEI is establishing an Advanced Reactor Oversight Task Force to act as a focal point for industry to engage with NRC on the development of Advanced Reactor Oversight Guidance. But success really starts from the beginning, and new nuclear being designed with intent. By designing with construction, inspection, and oversight in mind from the start. Industry is also learning from the past. We've implemented best practices in design, construction, maintenance, and inspection. These best practices will help industry ensure that designs can be constructed and inspected faster, resulting in less upfront capital before revenue is realized. These include the NEI construction best practices documents, including our latest implementation guide, which was posted this week and discusses three primary topics, first of a kind, managing construction labor efficiency, and modularization benefits and drawbacks. 
These documents will help industry deploy new nuclear projects safely, on time, and on budget. But one of the first documented best practices is the importance of design maturity. The design isn't, just the lar isn't the largest cost component in new nuclear projects, but it casts the largest shadow, in that if the design needs to be redone, a lot of other downstream work also needs to be reworked. A detailed, completed design enables better project planning and execution, including using more detailed construction methods. Tools like Digital Twin and 4D construction module, models do require upfront capital investment, but will enable more efficient construction and inspections. Faster construction not only saves money, but it also helps resolve the Gordian knot of workforce, as faster construction means less plants in construction at any given moment, and therefore less workers. Similarly, shifting modules and manufacturing activities off-site will further reduce the on-site construction workforce requirements. Other best practices are more generally applicable. EPRI developed a report last November that provides information on maintenance and inspection that can provide insights not only for industry, but also NRC, as it can help streamline pre and service inspections and oversight. Another key aspect that will both increase the efficiency of both construction and oversight is increased standardization. We need to build airplanes, not airports. Standardization is not only building the same plants numerous times, enabling improved outcomes due to lessons learned, moving down the lessons learned uh, learning curve, but it has also improved supply chain procurement by getting the same components. This results in easier inspection, not only because it is the same plant design, but the same components that are in that design. So it is the same process as, each, as those plants go forward for inspection. <clears throat> This, in turn, helps standardize how RCOP is applied across multiple deployments of the same design. Through these efforts, industry and NRC can ensure this flexible program will yield regulatory predictability and certainty for oversights and oversight activities while being grounded in safety to reach a reasonable assurance that these designs will achieve safe operation once completed. Predictability and certainty being two key enablers for new nuclear to achieve economies of numbers and realizing the widespread deployment that so many models, industries, and experts see in our future. I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Next slide, please. And with that, thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate those perspectives, and we look forward to the industry's insights as we continue to build this and get into the specifics of some of the key elements and activities uh, that you discussed. So we recognize the importance of looking for at to different audiences for input and perspective because we may not have all the right ideas within uh, the traditional nuclear uh, family. So with that, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Robert Cox uh, to our panel. He's the Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he also serves as the Associate Director of Energy Production and Infrastructure Center. He focuses his research on applying digital engineering to various problems in energy conversion. Robert? All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so a non-traditional uh, contributor to this conference, but very, really uh, welcome to be here. Uh, next slide, please. So what I wanted to talk about here today uh, is, is basically digital engineering. So I, I, Ben here spoke a little bit about building the airplane and rather, rather than the airport. Um, so for context here, what we're talking about is applying digital techniques. Everybody talks about digital twins these days, and, and I'm going to use terms, I'm, I apologize in advance, digital this or that throughout this whole thing, but I'm going to try to level set at the beginning a little bit. Um, going back about five or six years ago, our team at, uh, so I'm at University of North Carolina Charlotte, um, and our team uh, focuses on, on issues related to energy production. But going back about five or six years ago, uh, we were looking at um, a lot of what we were doing in the advanced manufacturing space uh, and beginning to think about how some of the digital engineering techniques that are used in advanced manufacturing could begin to be applied to construction generally uh, and nuclear construction specifically, right? A lot of the issues that we, that we see in building nuclear plants, I, I always say kind of relates, relates back to uh, moving dirt and pouring concrete, right? Those, those are a lot of the, the, the issues that affect schedule and cost. And the issue with, with building you know, an airport is, is that you're, you, everything's sort of one of a kind. Um, but given the move towards really using advanced manufacturing techniques uh, to prefabricate a lot of parts of the plant, 
we have the ability to potentially leverage some of those digital tools in a better way. And so some of the work that we're doing right now um, that, that my team is, is doing is part of the Advanced Construction Technology Initiative uh, under NRIC, uh, and that's why I mentioned it here on this slide. So I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. So I'll roll through the next couple of slides real quick here. Um, on, the, on the next one, what we talk about with, with respect to what, a, what is a digital uh, twin, it's always a, 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 tricky, a tricky question. Um, next slide, is it? There we go. So when I talk about what is a digital twin, just a level set, um, what you see there on the left is, is an actual physical object, and what you see on, on the right is, is a model of that. Now, one question we ask, is that a twin? And I would say, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's a model. That model looks like the real thing, but it's not quite a twin. Um, next slide. And the next question I always come up with is, this is the same sort of structure. If I have a model of that structure and that model can be updated to match reality, is that a twin? That's approaching much more like what I would, what I would say is, is, a, is a real twin. But ultimately, the, the bigger picture, if I talk about what is a true digital twin, if we go to the next slide, what, I, what we ultimately talk about in the, in, the, in the research context is ultimately a digital twin is that bottom picture where I have the physical world and I have a model of the physical world and those two things are, are seamlessly interchangeable and there's automated data flow from the real world to the model and from the model back to the real world. We're nowhere near that yet, right? That's the highest level of digital twin. What we're really trying to do is to begin this sort of pathway of, of using digital tools to really improve. I don't like the term twin. Um, but unfortunately, everyone's using it, and so, so we, we need to talk about what that, what that means. So where are we um, on this path? So next slide. Um, what we, what we kind of talk about in general, or the term that I like to use is, is in the manufacturing world, we talk about product lifecycle management. And if we talk about aircraft, uh, all, everything kind of fits into this product lifecycle management um, world, where basically what we do is we use model-based systems engineering. Okay, so essentially what we do is we have models that we develop at, at the design stage and we carry those models throughout the entire life cycle of a component. So at the top there is basically a chain where we go from design through construction all the way to end of life. What you can begin to do is, is if you use this model-based systems engineering approach, you develop models at the beginning of the life cycle of a component or a product. You map it across all of the serial numbers of that product that you make and you also try to track everything throughout the entire life cycle of, a, of an individual component. There's two key things about that. One is that you begin to take data and you untether it from documents, right, which is important because I can begin to make linkages between things. So my second point there about I begin, can begin to link models to each other. So here I've got a simple uh, steel composite structure that we made in our laboratory where basically we have the CAD model and the finite element model for that thing that are inherently linked. If I make a change in one, it makes a change in the other. Right? That's, the, that's one of the powerful things about these digital engineering techniques. Next slide. And what, next one, I guess. There we go. Yeah, so it, what, a lot of what our team was trying to focus on was basically how we begin to uh, use those techniques based on some of the findings that have come out over the last couple of years with respect to um, opportunities to use digital tools. So going back a couple of years, NEI report, EPRI report, MIT report that talked about construction specifically. And, and sort of four key areas that we looked at coming out of that was, first of all, uh, you know, there's been a longstanding history of using outdated design processes in construction in general, right? So how can we begin to, to introduce digital techniques into that? Um, digital techniques can help you to better manage documentation packages and really begin to allow you to do better decision making and really exploit the benefits of modularity. So what I have there is sort of an example um, that I'm going to talk about. But basically, you know, a lot of these uh, structures are going to be built, uh, or a lot of, the, let's say, the reactor building is, is you know, likely to be circular, likely to be underground for a lot of these newer, newer uh, SMRs. So what you see here is, is basically if I, you know, with steel composites, right, for instance, with the, with the X300, one of the things they're looking to do is a steel composite for the reactor building. You can begin to, because those are going to be, those modules will be built off-site, right, you can begin to do some interesting things potentially to track those modules as they move through their lifetime. And I'll use some examples of that as we go through. Next slide. So one of the things that we look at trying to do, say, so documentation packages is, is, a, is a potential issue that's always been noted uh, in, in the construction process. 
One of the things that, that we've done is, is utilizing basically a, a, something called dynam dynamic product navigation. So basically each of the modules that you have there, um, we've basically created it so that you, you have a clickable model of this particular, the entire structure. And you can basically drill down and track the entire um, life cycle of documentation associated with that particular module. So if you want to know what was happening at the, at the fab, if you want to know what's happening on site at some di different aspect of the construction, someone can pull up that information on site, even on a tablet, right? Um, so that's, that's, a, that's something that we can easily kind of leverage moving forward. And it's a pretty powerful technology. Next slide. Now, we often refer to these things as kind of the single source of truth, because one of the concerns always is if I have multiple documents and everything, there can be errors between those documents. So we begin to talk about a single source of truth, where essentially there's a single database where all of the key information is tracked. So if you think about that, that image that I showed on the previous slide, if you clicked on one of the modules, I should be able to see all of the data for that module and be able to see how it's progressed throughout its entire lifetime. And that's tracked in a computer rather than in, in sort of a standalone hard copy document. So you know, essentially what we, we talk about is, is I could begin to, and I'll use this example here, Essentially, I could have a surveyor that's on site um, that is collecting information about the actual, actual construction build. He can, take that, he can take data from a scan or, or a laser tracker measurement, something like that, process that data on site, and have it immediately update the, the CAD models and the finite element models, and to be able to share that information with team members broadly. And you can do that in a matter of, of minutes, okay? At least with some things that we'd like to be able to do, you can do it in a matter of minutes. Next slide. So as, as an example of that, um, what, we, what we do here is, this is again an example from our laboratory, where basically what we can do is we have our as-designed models, our, and then our, our as-designed finite element and as-built models. We can basically track using information that we've gotten from our scanners. We can go back and say, this is what we designed it to be. This is what it is right now. And we can update those two things, and we can go back and forth interchangeably to compare the design to, to what was actually built. Next slide. Now, what, what is important about this, as I said, is a single source of truth. So essentially what we have is a database behind all of this, where as an example here, I'm looking at as sort of my example uh, steel composite module I've got in the lab, where basically individual parameters, like the length of that thing, exist as individual parameters. I can track what it was on any given day throughout the actual life cycle of it from the time it was designed to the time where it is right now today in real time. So with that, to my next slide, one of the things that we look to be able to do with this is to leverage technologies like laser scanning and laser trackers. So in my image there, I'm not going to go through all the gory details of this, but if I look at my image there on the left, what I have is something called a laser tracker, right? So if you go on a construction site, you, you can see people with, with, a, with a laser tracking device. What I can do is, is basically do a quick scan, and I can, if I have targets on those modules, what we can do is we can actually track where the modules are placed in 3D space. We can take that information, feed that information back into our systems in the cloud, and then update you know, where a module is placed. And we can also use um, laser scanning to be able to get a sense of how wavy potentially the surface may be of one of those, one of those modules. So on the next slide there, so here's, here's an example of, of where we might use that. So imagine if we're building a steel composite structure. So it should be a great benefit to use modular construction techniques. I can prefabricate things before I bring them on site. Well, when you begin to place those modules on site, there's, there's a question of tolerance management, right? How do I make sure that when I place one module, I haven't offset it too much that I need to worry about where I place the next one? So what, what our team is looking to do, basically, is to take a, that image there on the bottom. Basically, th again, this is a, this, those are not obviously steel composite modules. This is what we're doing in the laboratory right now using plywood, but basically it's the same concept. Um, essentially trying to take the laser tracker data and be able to feed that information back into our models to, to update things. And, and basically using that uh, for um, uh, being able to, to help us in, implement a tolerance management program. So you can begin to imagine where this sort of thing might be useful uh, in, in the construction process. The next slide. Yeah, we'll jump ahead there. Yeah, so now the question as we develop this um, is the interface on the regulatory side. Um, if we talk to folks in the construction world, they, they like a lot of the concepts associated with this, but what scares, uh, what, frankly, what scares the crap out of them, I think, is that the regulators could see all the gory details of what may happen uh, in the process. 
Um, but one of the key things that we need to think through is, is how do you actually expose this information appropriately to a regulator, given that you, I mean, you've got enormous uh, amounts of data that you can track, it's got to be useful, but we don't want to track so much, potentially, or expose it at the wrong times that if we, if we get data that we're not certain about, we can begin to get into an analysis paralysis loop, and I think that's the concern that a lot of folks have. Um, but it's an exciting time to, to leverage some, some really new and interesting technology. So with that, I will leave it there. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I know I learned a lot from that, and I appreciate it. I now want to come down and maybe take a class from you um, and learn even more. So thank you for that. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our, our last speaker today. And some of you may be aware that the NRC and our Canadian colleagues at CNSC have been partnering on a number of activities related to SMRs and advanced reactors. And so we welcome uh, Sarah Eaton, uh, the Director General of the Directorate of Advanced uh, Reactor Technologies at the CNSC. Her directorate, is, her directorate is responsible for licensing new nuclear reactors, pre-licensing activities, including the vendor design review and leading SMR readiness readiness project for the CNSC, ensuring a coordinated matrix approach to organizational readiness for regulating SMRs and new advanced technologies. So with that, Sarah, please. Awesome. Thanks so much. The benefit of going last is I can just say agree with Nicole, agree with Jonathan, agree with Ben, agree with Robert, and call it a day. Um, but I am really happy to be here to talk about the Canadian landscape and the work that the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is doing in this space. Next slide, please. So I know every single one of you lie in bed every morning as an American and think, I wonder what is going on in Canada. Well, luckily today, you'll get your answer. So on this slide, we have on the right where we are today, um, and on the left on where we think we'll be in five years. And even since I've finished this slide, I feel like the five-year slide probably is out of date already. So today, we currently have 17 can-do reactors that are either op in operation or refurbishment. And then we have three separate SMR projects with three separate technologies. Looking at five year, out five years, we have additional SMR projects, likely some of the same technologies we're reviewing today, possibly another, uh, some of different ones. We have new advanced technologies, and we have to be determined large nuclear power plants. So I'm not gonna walk through every project in the timelines, but I am gonna draw focus on what's been mentioned before on Ontario Power Generation's proposal to deploy the BWX 300 at the Darlington site as this is the project that's front and center for us today. So we have a scenario where we're moving from a group of can-do experts, a comfortable spot of being experts in our field, to needing technical expertise in a minimum of five additional technologies, and to be honest, industry probably is gonna throw in at least one more. So of these technologies, Canada's posed to be potentially the first deployer in three, of the, three or four of those technologies. So it's a little bit of an unenviable position as a regulator to have everything Ben's laid out in front of us on scale of deployment, on rate of deployment. Um, but luckily, we've been thinking about this for a while, over a decade. And if we go to our next slide, it brings us to our SMR readiness project. And so we talk about SMR readiness in how it will prepare us for advanced nuclear, for small modular reactors, but it will prepare us for any new nuclear deployment that occurs in Canada, doesn't matter about size. In 2022, we initiated this project, which represents an integrated approach to optimizing our regulatory readiness for small modular reactors and advanced reactors. We have a budget of $50.7 million, a five-year timeline, and through that, we aim to address 60 objectives, over 60 objectives, which will help us prepare for new nuclear. We've organized our project into four pillars, the first being regulatory predictability, everyone's favorite pillar, which really helps us be able to ensure that our regulatory framework is up to date, technology uh, neutral, and has the necessary guidance and information that new applicants will need to be able to navigate the regulatory space. We have policy and shared responsibilities, which is our work with our federal and domestic partners to ensure that we are having a one regulator approach um, and that we're sharing and leveraging information where we can. We have international collaboration where we talk about the work we're doing with many of our partners, including our very good partners here um, at the NRC, which helps us ensure that we are finding efficiencies where we can in our regulatory processes. And finally, capacity and capability, which is really ensuring that we have the talent we need, that they have the skills they need to address what we have in front of us, which is a massive culture of change for us. 
And what comes, cuts across all of these pillars is that need for cultural change. As we transition from expertise in one technologies to expertise in multiple technologies, increased collaboration with other partners, and the rate at which industry wants to deploy, innovate, and change. And so it's a culture shift for us, um, and this readiness work really helps us build that culture change and be able to support it. Next slide, please. So I want to sort of bring our readiness project to the panel, the topic of our panel today, which is looking at advanced construction. So in, if similar to what Jonathan and Nicole spoke about, their key principles also align with our key principles. So our newest can-dos, the newest can-dos we have, began construction the same year I was born, 1981. And so as today is my birthday, I really tried to link first concrete pour. Thank you very much, thank you very much. <laughs> I really tried to link first concrete pour today to, to today, to March 13th, but sadly I could not, it was in June. So as a regulator, we haven't overseen new reactor construction in over 40 years. So as a result, we have no modern compliance oversight plans, and this objective deals with that gap. This objective ensures that we have a generic plan that we can tailor for, for different technologies, and we will use it should OPG be approved for the deployment of the BWX300. The team that developed this plan was, um, came from across the organization, ensuring a two key approach from our technical services branch and also our operations branch. And while we don't have the recent experience, as Nicole and, John, and Jonathan and Ben have described, there's lots of experience out there. So we've leveraged that experience to ensure that we can learn from, those, from, from the lessons that were learned and be able to find efficiencies in our program. And we also leverage the lessons we've learned from our own can-do refurbishment, which has obviously been massive projects, which has allowed us to be able to modify and have agile construction, sorry, agile compliance plans. And so during this period of novel approaches to designs and the construction, it's critical for us to focus on the novel features, the first-of-a-kind features, using a risk-informed approach on what really matters. And this generic plan, as I said, will be tech neutral. We'll be able to use it for multiple different technologies. Next slide, please. So our inspectors and our inspection program is robust and it's world class. What we learned from COVID that was while virtual inspections are a great tool to add to our, to our toolbox, in-person inspections are critical for compliance oversight. And that is especially true for novel and, and new features. Like all mature regulators, we have a variety of inspection tools and all of these will come into play for our current inspections and for any future inspections for advanced construction. We use a performance-based, risk-informed approach, multi-year inspection plan that allows us to consider, that allows the flexibility to consider for innovation and new licensee approaches. And the innovation tools for inspectors that we're looking at today, such as virtual reality, drones, artificial intelligence, are gonna change at a rate that will be uncomfortable for us as regulators and will require, again, additional culture change. But burying our, hand, our head in the sand and having a mouthful of sand isn't that comfortable either. And so we have an expert group in our organization who's supporting us, working very closely with the Canadian industry to see how they are using innovation and how we can use those innovation tools to support our compliance oversight. Next slide, please. So, I'm not just going to talk about how much we love working with the NRC, because we love working with the NRC. Um, but our, our, this collaboration really has been pivotal in our preparations for new nuclear in Canada. From our perspective, collaboration builds positive relationships among regulators, which for us is necessary for the safe and effective deployment, um, the broad deployment of small modular reactors. In 2019, we signed a memorandum of cooperation on advanced reactor and SMR technologies to enhance our bilateral collaboration. And last evening, we were able to sign a trilateral agreement to bring the UK ONR into that as well. Our memorandum of cooperations allows us to do pre-licensing engagement, licensing reviews, to share science, research, and to develop common regulatory positions. For the BWX300, we have a very unique five-party, it was, it was five-party as of when I wrote these speaker's notes, now six-party agreement, um, which allows us to be able to work together on technology-specific aspects. So we've been doing a joint review um, on advanced construction techniques, and we're looking, to, we're looking to work towards where we can, harmonizing compliance plans, leveraging supply chain inspections, and this is really the life cycle collaboration we need to be able to be efficient and effective regulators once we have these standardized designs. 
And of course, our staff are learning from NRC staff on the Vogel Opera um, lessons learned, and we're looking to be able to capture those best practices as we continue to update our new compliance plans, but also our existing compliance plans. Next slide, please. So building trust. All of our readiness work, collaboration with international partners will mean nothing if we aren't seen as a trusted regulator and, we're, and we are known for our independence. Through our trust strategy, we're strengthening our relationships with the public, environmental groups, and indigenous nations and communities. Developing strong relationships with indigenous nations and communities is deeply important to the CNSC, and we're committed to building long-term sustainable relationships. And so part of that relationship building has been a request from indigenous communities to participate in our independent environmental monitoring program and also to observe, observe how we conduct inspections. And from our perspective, this is a really important way for us to be able to share our experience that can help build a common understanding of the safety of our ongoing facilities and also the safety of these novel construction approaches. These approaches are first of a kind. And so as scientific-based people, as regulators, we're working through how, how we can look at that through a safety lens. But for the public, it's brand new. For indigenous nations, it's brand new. So it's really an opportunity for us to be able to share that information and to be able to um, include the lessons that we can learn from indigenous nations and communities and continue to build that culture of change. Next slide, please. So in closing, uh, we are committed to innovative, risk-informed decision-making processes when building our compliance programs. We don't necessarily have as much time as was shown on the NRC uh, schedule to be able to integrate these plans and to be able to use them. Um, and that's why for us, integrating those lesson, international lessons learned are key. Uh, for our perspective, international collaboration is a critical part to our work. And it has to be a life cycle collaboration to ensure that we're able to gain those efficiencies over the life cycle. And as we look at this period of growth from the industry, it's a period of growth for regulators as well, where we have to build capacity and capability. We need to find talent in a place, in a time when talent is not easy to find. Um, and we also have to assess how we continue to assess multiple projects, different technologies at the same time. Um, building culture for change is critical, whether it's for advanced construction, whether it's for international collaboration or indigenous nations, building relationships with indigenous nations and communities. But I know that we are up for the challenge, and I know we're well placed to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So thank you, Sarah, and happy birthday. And your present will be that we will not sing a happy birthday to you at this time, maybe later. Um, so I wanna thank the, um, and I think you, you hit a really good point is, and, and something I wanna elaborate on is that I think we're recognizing the United States, uh, Canada, UK, and many other countries that, that nuclear deployment is a global activity now. It's not just a national activity. And the more we collaborate on our efforts such as these, the more we can harmonize and enable the, the safe deployment of some of these technologies as we go forward. So I do wanna thank the audience. We're gonna move into Q&A. We have a number of questions already from the audience. We have 31 minutes left, so that is wonderful. I wanna thank my panelists for moving through their presentation so efficiently. Um, and that'll give us plenty of time to answer some questions. So if you have questions, we're gonna have some time in here, so please uh, put them in based on the presentations you've heard, and, and we'll hopefully get to, to a number of these. Um, so the first one, and, and I think I'll, I'll send this one to my NRC colleagues and to, uh, to Ben, is, is an important one. And it highlights a difference um, with what the type of technology we'll see and the type of construction we'll see going forward. So as the industry is moving to true modular factory built approaches, how is the NRC preparing for oversight, NSC and industry, preparing for oversight of the modular fabrication activities completed in a central factory? So. Nicole, John, you want to start, and then Ben can sure. chime in. Sure, I'll uh, I'll take that. You know, the um, it's a it's a really good question. It does present a bit of a challenge, as Ben kind of alluded, you know, mentioned in in his discussion. Uh, our past practice, our past experience was really stick built designs. Everything you know was happening under the auspices of, a, of the oversight of a licensee at a particular site. We've always uh, inspected vendors that provide uh, you know components or maybe small systems. Um, but the bulk of the activity was done at the site, and the new landscape really presents a, a different challenge. Um, there are a lot of similarities to how, um, you know, being able to inspect off-site, but, but being able to do it in a way that we're inspecting the right things at the right time 
um, so that we're not in a position where we're just inspecting everything, right? That's not where we want to we want to be uh, in a risk-informed and performance-based framework. So, so one of the things I you know talked about um, was looking at kind of uh, an integrated inspection scoping matrix where you look at the project and you say, what are the you know w w based on this design that a licensee or an applicant has submitted, um, what are important things? But you know, what can I leverage from what I know? Um, you know, a, a risk-informed um, you know, process underpinning risk informed. Obviously, we, we talk about um, likelihood and consequence. Underpinning that is uncertainty. And so, one of the things with modular construction, especially as you go from a first of a kind build through second, third, through nth of a kind, is you learn a tremendous amount of information. And we have to have a system that that is able to factor that information in. If, certainly, if it if the industry gets to a, a deployment schedule that that Ben talked about, where um, you know. Dozens are, of reactors are being constructed in a year. We need to be able to leverage that experience so that we aren't necessarily performing the same level of inspection for each one of those units, and we're learning as we go along and scaling ourselves appropriately. So it presents a challenge. We are thinking about that. One of the best parts of of uh, getting into where we're at now, where we're starting to engage uh, through workshops, is being able to learn about the different deployment models that some of our some of the vendors are are. Uh, you know, contemplating so that we can make sure that our system is flexible enough to adapt to any of those realities. Um, so it's, it's really an exciting time. We are thinking very hard about that to make sure we come up with a program um, that will ultimately address it, but we look forward to continued engagement with, with you know, NEI as well as any of the vendors to make sure whatever we're coming up with does satisfy uh, the landscape that's ultimately going to come. Yeah, so just to, to add to that, I, I, I appreciate the the, the initial the initial comments and I think it's a good question the the challenge of course is that the the devil will always be in the details and so I I can't come here and say well clearly we're going to do X Y Z and that's going to work for every possible iteration that we're going to come up with but I think the right framework or the way that we're thinking about this is is right in the sense of as we're moving activities away from site, clearly we don't want to be doing the same activities in terms of oversight and inspection, both at where this is being manufactured and then again at the site. But depending on what we're building, how we're building it, how accessible is it going to be after shipment, those are all going to impact when and where you can actually do the oversight most effectively. Now, of course, if you let's Let's just say that in the most extreme case, it's a micro reactor, it's all sealed up at the factory. You do your inspections and oversight there. When it shows up at site, there's still probably something that we have to do in order to ensure that it, it was received and, it, and is still um, in the right condition for operation once it gets there. What does that look like exactly? We're, we're working on that, right? It's clear that you don't want to have a one-to-one -one recheck of everything, but it's also clear that you should do something to reassure that you have a reasonable assurance that it's going to operate and work the way we think it is. And I think as we, as Jonathan was mentioning, as you start going forward and we figure out exactly what the process and what some of these deployment scenarios actually look like, we'll have more details. But I think at the same time, as we start laying out, here's what the strategy for this deployment actually looks like of the different designs and technologies, we'll enable ourselves to kind of come up with, here is how this flexible framework is going to be enacted for this design, for this application, and then we'll be able to apply and move that forward consistently for the, that design. Thank you. The only thing I would add to that is, um, so some of these concepts are not new to new, uh, the NRC. You know, we have inspected modularization. We have uh, looked at vendors. We have looked at factory acceptance testing. So some of these concepts are new, but applying them more globally across more di you know, different technologies, um, more consistently over a number of different sites or facilities, that's where we have to be innovative. And that's where our framework is looking at how do we be scalable, technology neutral, but you know we're going to continue to use the lessons we've learned from the past to apply it to the future. Um, so modularization is a complex issue. 
that we saw from both the regulatory side and then from the industry side. So there's learnings to be happened and from all perspectives um, for, you know, for the future of this if it's going to be uh, primarily focused in, in that area of construction. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this next one, I'm going to uh, start with Robert. Um, recognizing that we're looking at risk-informed and performance-based approaches, um, I'm going to specifically target this question towards the technology. How can it be, how can the technology really benefit us in terms of cost and schedule efficiencies for the construction of these, these facilities? Where do you see the biggest impacts being? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think one of the, one of the areas that you know, we've, you know, looked at is ultimately, like, as an example, we talked about these, these um, modules as they move through from the factory to the site. Um, you know, one of the areas that we look at, and first of all, is just better document management. Um, and and you know, if you look back at, at sort of past experience, all, all of the issues associated with being able to just, again, just from a construction perspective, being able to track where, where are, is all of the information about all of the, the, the modules and whatnot, but we'd be able to leverage the technology to be, you know, scan a, a, a code on the, on the side of the, the module to be able to pull up on a, on a tablet all the documentation that you would need. Um, associated with that. So document turnover becomes better managed, for instance, which is one of the things that's been noted as, as really slowing down a lot of processes in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, the other example would be, you know, that I, that I kind of always go back to is things like, um, you know, tolerance management um, as, re, as you're placing, you know, modules. You, you can begin to, um, you know, sort of better be able to track if, if something's been misplaced, what's the, what's the impact on that? And so if, if, you, if you have a nonconformance, you know, and you have to go back through and, and do analysis and disposition, you know, the significance of that, you, you should be able to do a lot of that analysis a lot more rapidly. Um, and that's, that's one of the big advantages that we see. Um, the, the other element that, that we look for ultimately is, you know, I didn't talk about it a whole lot here, but um, leveraging sensor data on site. You know, for instance, one of the things that, we're gonna, that you have a lot of issues with if we have underground uh, shafts, for instance, um, how, do we, how do we leverage sensor data uh, to be able to sort of track what's happening throughout um, construction? Uh, and, and that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're working on testing right now. Um, but that's, there's a lot of opportunities to be able to use data to, to speed up a lot of the aspects of, say, underground inspection um, and the geotechnical side of, of the build. So, you know, it, it really is, is a matter of, of being able to sort of um, I think we talk about leveraging the modularity, but you know, how, do we, how do we begin to sort of better track the information, use the ability to track it, um, and use sensor data uh, and with, with, with an understanding that um, sensor data needs itself to be trusted and validated on a regular basis. Um, so th those, those are where a lot of the questions lie, I think, but, but there's, there's a significant opportunity, I think, to begin to, in, in particular, look at the notion of if, if something happens in the process, in the construction process, how do you do a much quicker analysis of, of what the issues may be associated with that, and how do you better control document management and turnover? Thank you for that, Robert. Greatly appreciated. Maybe to the, to the panel, right? If we're a few years from now, and we've implemented these activities, and we talked a little bit about assessment throughout the, the, the effort, what is your measuring stick for whether you'll know whether we've been successful in developing a program um, and one that works the way we envision it. And maybe I'll start with Ben and ask him to, to define success for this at the end of the day and then ask other uh, panelists to, uh, to weigh in. That's what I get for making eye contact, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think, it's a, I think it's a good question. I mean, where we are today, we can look at what does the oversight and program look like when, for Vogel, for example. And Vogel was, I think, five inspectors and several thousand hours worth of, worth of work. And if we say, okay, we've developed this program, and you know what, that's, that's where we are, we have no, me no measurable gain, well, well clearly that was a, a problem. We didn't succeed at that one. We didn't assess and implement a risk-informed process. I think if we can look at it and we say, yeah, this, we can see how designs that have less risk of public health and safety have less oversight associated with them, we were accessing this in the right framework. One, one thing I think that we would want to see in this program is the differentiation of 
protection of public health and safety versus the protection of the asset itself. There is a difference, right, between having saying that we have a design and if we turn it on, there's a problem and we're going to have a radiation release or some dose or something that's going to go wrong and saying, well, you've destroyed, your, you've destroyed your asset. It's not actually going to be able to operate, but there's no real risk to anyone. It's just you're not going to make any money. Um, I think figuring out how to differentiate and tar specifically target um, you know, how do we ensure the, the adequate protection of public health and safety for, will be a key enabler of whether or not we have a successful program? Great. Others on the panel want to weigh in? So um, maybe, maybe I would add, you know, when, when we're designing the program, typically when you think about an oversight program, you come up with, okay, here are a list of inspection procedures we're going to execute and we're going to do an X number of samples um, and, and that's going to result in X number of hours of inspection. What we're designing, I think, is a little bit different because maybe you know, complementing what, what Ben just said, each of these designs is going to present different, a different risk profile, a different level of complexity, passive versus active systems, number of systems, number of ITACs. So we need to design a decision-making process that stands up to the rigor so that when we receive a new design, a new application, or a new um, you know, design certification, new you know, manufacturing license, that we can implement that, that decision-making process, engage with the applicant to make sure that whatever oversight framework looks like for that particular design, that it's right-sized to that design um, and, and appropriate to the circumstances and, and withholds, you know, holds up to the scrutiny uh, that it should. So, so I think that's where, you know, success for, for me is we've developed a decision-making process so that we can right-size, develop a scaled inspection footprint, um, and we have the appropriate decision-making processes down the line so that we can continue to evolve that, that, uh, that inspection plan for future builds um, in, in consistent with those principles and our principles of good regulation. I think that would be success for, for us. Sarah, do you want to weigh in? Thanks. I think I'm going to define my success a little differently. <laughs> um, and I think it's because we have a scenario where we could have constructions um, at this site um, in Canada starting in 2025. Um, and so I think from, from our perspective, we would look at the early measures of success was, was the project able to be executed correctly, you know, safely according to timeline and schedule. Um, were we able to do the inspections that we needed? Did we get the information we had to, we needed? And then to do an assessment after that to say, okay, what would we need to do for the same unit? You know, if there was to be unit two, unit three, or this unit in another location to be able to look at it, that aspect. I think it's important that we can plan for every possible scenario, but we need to execute on the one in front of us. And so we certainly are focused on executing on the one in front of us while acknowledging that there's definitely work to be done. There's so many interesting deployment scenarios, and I think Ben's part about the models is, is totally true. Who knows what's gonna happen? Um, but for the ones that we have in front of us, we have to focus our energies to make sure that we're doing those right. Thank you. If I can add one thing. Sure, please. So the, what I would note is, you know, from the NRC's mission statement, you know, our success measure is public health and safety, protection of the environment, and security of these facilities. There are some challenges out there that what does that look like with these new, and, and they're questions, they're not necessarily challenges, but the actions that we have to work through. What does it look like for a potential mobile reactor? What does it look like for the environment? What does it look like for protection of public health and safety? So, you know, to me, the success measure is that the regulatory decisions, the licensing and the inspection oversight that's done provides reasonable assurance while continuing to make our mission. And, and there's, because there's new questions in the future, we don't know what those need to do, and working through that is gonna be of the highest importance. Thanks. Um, so John was touching on something that I think is important to follow up, and we had a good question here uh, from somebody. Um, Maybe it would be good for the panel to elaborate on their vision related to this. So considering the huge design differences between advanced reactor designs, will there be separate RCOP guidance for each type of reactor, or will the guidance be so general as to potentially not be useful? So. <laughs> It's an uh, good, honest question. That's a good, that's an honest question. It's a fair question. Um, so I think, you know, so I, I'll, I'll point to two things. 
Um, so one of the things when, when we're developing or thinking about a technology inclusive framework, we, we really need to think about what's common across all the designs. And there are some things that are common. So certainly what systems, structures, and components are used to satisfy, and I talked about the, the, uh, the fundamental safety functions. Each designer is going to you know, use their or develop their design to, to ensure that they control reactivity, they remove the heat, remove, you know, um, that's, that's generated and they control radionuclides. But then underpinning all of that and I, and I, that I mentioned was every designer and as they go through construction is going to need to implement quality assurance program attributes. And so if we're inspecting and looking at how they're building their SSCs, but really what we're looking at is how are they implementing their quality assurance programs. And, and then can use that level of inspection to draw conclusions about things that we're not there for, right? We do a sampling-based inspection program. We're not going to look at, at every single component that's constructed. But they're using the same processes, procedures, um, and programs to affect the, the results that they're looking for. So I think that, that's a common, you know, regardless of technology, um, you know, quality assurance programs, they'll define what, what that is, and that'll be approved in their, in their application. But that's a good basis and generally common that I think we see. So when we, when we develop inspection guidance, what we would really want to be looking at is how are they implementing their QA programs and is it resulting in a quality output, um, you know, a quality uh, component, quality system, quality uh, plant. Um, and, and so if we focus on that, I think we can, general, we can get some, some common uh, threads that, that'll, that'll give us good guidance regardless of design. Certainly, I think there are some um, different aspects that we'll have to create uh, specialized inspection for, um, right? We, we may need to look at, you know, how, uh, you know, salt content of, of, you know, if it's a molten salt reactor, right? There may be some aspects that are specific to that that may warrant some specific guidance, and we can address that on a case-by-case -case basis. But underpinning that, there's, there should be quality assurance attributes that are ensuring that they're, that they're meeting. So it's still largely very similar um, and then we can look for what specific design differences warrant um, specific information for our inspectors. So I'm going to do a very dangerous thing and, and slightly disagree with you. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying that, I want to say that is, I think the question, which was a very interesting question, is missed a, an opportunity for a third choice. Okay. Uh, and the third choice I think that we're, we're missing is, you know, when we described the system, when we described the oversight program of what we're trying to set up here, it is a risk-informed, performance-based, technology-neutral framework. And if we d set this up correctly, it works for all the different technologies because we have principles that we apply to that technology and it yields a different answer depending on what your technology looks like. This is the same process that we've been working with NRC, uh, we industry have been working with NRC on for many years now, uh, the licensing modernization project. And we've already had all, several successes already to, under our belts in the development of different guidance and industry is using this to develop topical reports, to develop applications. And I think this is just another step in that using the licensing modernization technology neutral risk informed performance based approach. And so I don't necessarily know that we'll need to have specific uh, guidance that will have to be overly prescriptive or something that's so general that we can't use it. I think we build the tools and then the tools will be applied to the different technologies to yield an acceptable and workable solution. Said, said maybe another way, I think we share a common vision is that the, the tool, if built properly, will focus you on the right things to inspect. Yep. And those will be different depending on the technologies, but shouldn't build it overly complex for one technology versus another. And you want to test the program over and over again with sanity checks to make sure it's focusing on the right, right things. That's part of the assessment program. Yep. So. Yep. Great. Robert, um, love the technology. Love the idea of leveraging the technology. Um, I had the opportunity to work on Volvo, and Nicole did as well. We saw a number of challenges with the first-of-a-kind construction that Vogel was going through. And we saw with Unit 3, they encountered some challenges, they learned from those, and then they applied them to Unit 4, and construction went much more efficiently. How can the technology 
help us avoid those first of a kind challenges for, for new um, construction builds? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, where, where it really begins to help is when I do second of a kind, right? And third of a, because, because you have the ability to carry, carry the information through and you don't have to rebuild everything in the same way that you did before. Effectively, you're building twins, I guess, if I use that, continue with that terminology. Um, you know, I, I think as it relates to the, the first of a kind um, technique, again, I, I think a lot of it is, is we need to begin to look at um, how we leverage the technology to build out better QA processes, right? Um, at, at some level, that's really a lot of what the tool is able to, or tools are able to do, is, is to leverage those technologies. My fear is what's gonna happen is that as, they, as you do first of a kind, technology is gonna be both costly and, and potentially slow things down. Um, and that's, that's, that's the fear that I think I have with a lot of the use of, of technology, that the advantage is probably going to come further, further okay. down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's something that I think that, that needs to be worked through uh, for sure. But, but, you know, it's clear that, you know, particularly for, you know, look, looking at, you know, like, you know, for instance, some of the things that we've seen with in talking to folks at Vogel, the opportunity to be able to leverage um, technology for, for QA, QC, I think that's where, you know, I think we see a lot of the advantages and opportunities. Um, for, for first of a kind, I think that's where it really does get to be challenging because my fear is that it could slow things down um, when you're testing and piloting things. Um, uh, but I, I think, you know, I think it's, once you break through that, I think you're gonna see that the, the, the benefits are exponential as you begin to move to, to two and three and beyond. So, so Ben, you wanna weigh in? Yeah, if I wanna add, add to that a little bit. I think that, so I think, Certainly, you're, you're, you very well stated that, you know, in order to, when we build the models, when we put all the pieces in place, that's, that's additional cost and there's additional effort in order, in order to do that. I think one of the things that we, these tools will help us do is some, there's some aspects I think the tools will help us do, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but I think the sheer act of ensuring that we have all of the information to the level of detail that we could use the right. tools right. will help us a lot for the first of a kind deployments. Right. Because a lot of the challenges that we've seen are not related to, okay, well, is the tool itself going to cause challenges? But it's related to, well, we didn't have the, des the design finished enough. And yeah. we weren't able to have, we didn't actually have the, the supply chain set up to have this piece come in right. And the work when when we had the workers actually doing the construction activities at the site, we didn't make we didn't realize that we had an issue, and then we weren't sure where those workers were going to be able to go because they couldn't do the activity that we originally had them planned for for that day. Yeah. And some of the some of the advantages of setting up the these advanced tools is that now because I can see better the totality of the project. I can say, okay, well, this was late, and yes, that'll improve as we move down the, you know, the um, from first of a kind towards nth of a kind. But if I know, okay, I can move these workers over here to do this other activity because the, all of these components are available, even though that's not necessarily the fir the thing that's most urgent on my schedule today, that enables me to still move projects forward in terms of completion. So. Just, I just wanted to add that to, to your yeah, response, no, but I think that was... And, and just to, to add on, I mean, that, that, those are a lot of the driving principles yeah. that you would look for. And I, and I think um, just the notion that you would be able to, uh, you know, I, I, in nuclear, I think it's always, you know, is the design finished? You know, we want to be done done is always the term that I hear. But, you know, you, you have much more of an ability to be able to do a lot of these what-if scenarios in construction that Ben, that ben was talking about. And I, and I think the challenge, I, you know, is, is really just to say, once you have that ability, you can start asking a lot of questions. And I think the, the fear that I have for the first couple is if you begin to ask too many of those questions, yeah. does that ultimately slow things down? Yes. Yeah. And I would say that the size and scalability of the projects will have a big impact on, you know, the impacts of first-of-a-kind issues. You know, when you're talking about a design that is robust, that has, you know, less significant safety welds or components or systems or testing, you know, those kind of, if you have learning growing pains as you're working through these systems, 
um, it's not going to have the significant resource timing schedule delays that you would for a large light water reactor. So, you know, there's going to be some pros and cons to this new type, type of technology. I'd also, you know, maybe to, to add in from an oversight um, piece too, I think digital technologies, you know, add, there's, there's, when we talk about risk informed, I think design risk is, is fairly well understood. This component, this, you know, vessel has, is of such and such safety significance because in this accident scenario it performs this function. But the other uh, aspect of risk informed that we think about in construction oversight is construction risk. And, and the way we talk about that is what's the likelihood that a deficiency would make it to operations? And I think some of the digital uh, technologies that allow for self-checking, audit, you know, um, you know, one of the features in a lot of digital INC systems that are being deployed is because you can eliminate a lot of different testing because it's going to self-test all the time. And, and if there are, are technologies out there that are being deployed that ensure that deficiencies are um, recognized very quickly and then can be brought into the models and, and, and resolved, that lowers the construction risk, right? And we need to be able to factor that into our decision making to, to reflect that, right? And, and so we shouldn't necessarily need to inspect to the same degree if the system's inspecting itself. And maybe what we're actually looking at is, is you know, part of the QA check is, well, what, what sort of self-checks and, 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 you know, QA, you know, QA um, attributes are being employed at that level. So I, I think, it, you know, even on first of a kind, I think we, those are things we need to be aware of um, and, and, and certainly make sure it's factored into our, into our decision making. Great. So we have three minutes left, and I want to get one last question in because I think it's an important one, and it gives us an opportunity to talk about something that we haven't had a chance to touch on. So I'm going to direct it to Nicole and John just a little bit here and, and invite others to weigh in. Some new reactor designs claim that the fuel cannot fail, which serves as a key assumption for the overall safety case. With this assumption, there seems to be a heavy reliance that fuel design and manufacturing is of the highest quality. What are we doing with fuel manufacturing oversight to ensure the safety case is met? Can you guys elaborate on how we're interfacing with those building the fuel cycle oversight program uh, going forward and, and making sure that we're integrated in, in our approach to overall safety for the facilities? Yeah, thank you, Rob. I think that's a great question because when I, when I talked about earlier in the presentation about a holistic approach, this, this perspective on oversight framework development uh, for scalable, flexible, technology neutral, this is not isolated to RCOP. This is for fuels, fuel facility, this is for the non-power production utilization facilities. This is the, the fuel cycle, life, the life cycle of the fuel system. So w what's happening is with fuels, because it's the first to, to be developed, we're working with the program office, the same folks are working with the program office to ensure that, that our inspection guidance is scalable, is flexible, it's able to consider the different fuels that are going to be built to support these, these new advanced reactors. Um, we're also going out, we're, we're working with uh, the program office and the licensing application uh, applicants. We've had several public meetings, the same as, uh, as John was talking about for the RCOP, the workshops, having open platform communications to have this dialogues because they're also asking the same questions from, you know, fuel cycle perspective. So it's, it's an important time for the regulatory framework, and we're trying to be at the forefront of this new, this new generation of, of advanced reactors, advanced fuel, and the fuel cycle is absolutely part of that, that, key, mm -hmm. that key program. Great. So we have just under a minute. Anybody else want to add to that? I would. I would probably just also add in. You know, we we certainly uh, are leveraging and partnering with uh, the research and test reactor oversight. Absolutely. Which, you know, as as Ben mentioned before, some of these new advanced reactors are going to, from a risk standpoint, may look a lot closer to what a, a research and test reactor. So while though they you know they have a separate oversight program, we certainly need to learn from them, and leverage their experience. Um, it's a good opportunity to to. Uh, benchmark and, and look at how our decision making process, how would it apply to an RTR and is it right sized? Would it give us a right sized approach or not? And then go back and adjust. So that's another program that we're certainly stayed tied in. With. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely included in yeah. the overall framework. Well, great. Um, so we did not get to all the questions 
here. So if you did not get your question answered, we'll be around here shortly after this. So please come up to us, talk to us, and, and we're happy to elaborate. Or if you had a question you didn't get, didn't get a chance to put in, please do so. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask the audience to, to join me in thanking the participants in the panel and their contribution and, and their efforts on this very important topic. So thank you, guys. With that, we'll close out the session. Thank you all.